Get your stinking rat out. It's late night large. Welcome to another edition of Lockdown Large Extra Time. The Euro Special. We've kept you waiting, of course, because as you know, the timing was a little bit off. We decided it would be more pertinent to wait till the second phase was concluded rather than barreling before it was. So now we have a better impression of the, the bigger picture. So we're uh, we're just at the end of the second phase. And before we get onto the inevitable, we will do our usual of going through uh, what we thought of the games in sort of chronological order, Mike, like we normally do, yeah? So we left off last time, I believe, just before the uh, Belgian played Finland. That's what I've got written down anyway. I think that was the, the initial. Did, did you get a chance to watch that, the, the Belgian-Finland game? That really where we left it? Yes, Mike, because I, I deliberately made a note of all the games that we were meant to cover. So, yeah, it began with Belgium 2, Finland 0. So we left it halfway through the match day three. Yes, that's how it worked. Anyway, did you watch the Belgian Finland game? I'm trying to remember. I don't even remember that now. No, was um, okay. I've, I've made a note here because I had to make notes because uh, obviously there's so many games coming thick and fast. I believe was it. It was either, I don't know if it was the first or the second, was a hilarious own goal by the goalkeeper. I think it was where it, it got, it, it hit the bar and then the goalkeeper kind of reached behind him and it, it hit his hand and bounced in. Uh, so anyway, I think the what I took mainly out of the Belgian-Finland game, uh, Finland were brave, but as expected, they don't have the quality. Um, they, they just didn't. Amazing kit, but not enough quality. Uh, Belgium, Belgium haven't really blown teams away, but they were clearly too good for Finland, so it wasn't a huge shot. But yeah, like I say, another goalkeeper own goal, so that was the second of the tournament, I believe, at the time, uh, and not the last. Uh, and then we had the Russia-Denmark game, so that was 4-1 to Denmark. What did you think of this, Mike? Well, I mean... Because there's a couple of interesting... Oh. Interesting points about that game. Well, I mean, yeah, well, go on, because I mean, I, I, for me, from what we'd seen before, I did see, you know, I didn't really look past Denmark, but I think a four-one spanking was a little bit of a didn't didn't quite expect that. But, but you know, the um, the interesting thing about that game, Mike, is it only became clear a bit later. But right now, where we're at now, we're looking at Denmark, thinking, oh, dark horses. You know, they're, they're looking handy. But we forget, um, and I'll come back to this later, they lost their opening two group games. Now, that's normally unheard of that a team can progress having lost their opening two group games. And the reason they progressed effectively is because they dicked Russia. If they hadn't, like, really handed their asses to them, um, they probably wouldn't have been able to qualify even with a win. Uh, because they beat them 4-1. And, Mike, did you see the... I love I love it when these things happen. The hilarious back pass was it the the, the Russians did where a defender <laughs> a defender played it across his own box. There didn't seem to be any Russian players anywhere near it. The goalkeeper did that brilliant thing where he panicked and started scrambling and fell over, but still continued like trying to swim to catch the ball. <laughs> um, and effectively, that's what you that's what you're taught as a kid, isn't it? Like needlessly pass the ball across your own box uh, yeah. every opportunity yeah i think i think yeah that that's number one is either be sure to always blindly play the ball across your own box and the other one is always if you're if you're under pressure always hit a swerving back pass within the posts because you can mm. always rely on your goalkeeper to control it so yeah, every yeah. time yeah, um, but yeah, Denmark. Denmark looked really impressive in that game. That was when they started coming to life. What was it? Was it? Um, oh man, I forget the name. There was a Danish player scored a brace. Uh, I'm not going to remember, am I? But they what, got in that game? yeah, yeah. 
I thought there were four different scorers in my no, I think there was a good, there was a break. I can't remember. Anyway, um, it, amazing comedy with the bat pass. Um, every part of it was just comedy. And um, Denmark started looking really impressive in that game. And also, as we've already said, Russia looked like the team we expected they were at 20, in 2018. Clearly, when they were at home, it elevated them. Now they're more at their level where they're just as capable of these comedy spankings as anything else. And um, again, they, they put that massive lump Juba up front again. Did, in fact, did he score their goal? I forget. Yeah. Really, yeah. I mean, to be fair, he did, sure he did. Uh, yeah, to be fair, he did score their goal. But one of my friends uh, made a made a gag about, um, well, now Russia out of the tournament, it's back to maximum security prison for it. <laughs> he did because yeah, he he did like that kind of character. Um, so Denmark, um, brilliant final result, basically um, sneaked them through uh, by the back door. Over to Sorry, our Mike. over to our group. So Mike. Uh, was it a surprise to you that Croatia knocked Scotland out? No. No. I, no. Uh, I, don't, th I don't think anyone was really surprised by that, were they? As, as much as I don't like to patronise Scotland, because I know they hate it when you do that, this is their first tournament in 23 years. So it's like, be happy you're here and you've got a great result against us, possibly could have sneaked a result against us. But you blew it against the Czechs. Um, the Czechs was the was the game they had to win. Uh, Croatia, basically, who had been mediocre, they just recovered their form at the right time. Uh, did, I take it you were very impressed by the Modric goal? Well, everything about Modric impresses me, to be honest. Oh, does it? Um, I, and I think the day he hangs up his boots will be a sad day for football. Well, uh, what greater... What greater testament can you get? But let's, I mean, let's be fair. Modric won, Modric literally won the Ballon d'Or, what was it, in 2018. So we knew what a talent he is. But I think what I remember what I said to a friend about him, Mike, is he doesn't look like a footballer at all, does he? If you t for anyone who doesn't know football, if you look at Luka Modric, I mean, he looks, he looks awkward, gawky. Uh, he's got no strength, no pace. But as I said, he, he plays like he's in carpet slippers and he's just like pulling the players around on marionette strings. He's just so clever and his technical ability. And so, yeah, the, the goal against Scotland, it was just... I, I've seen goals like that before, obviously, that you get that from high calibre players. But it, it, was, it was how he did it. It was how... It didn't seem to be a big deal when he did it. You know, when you get players like, I'm trying to think, um, Charisma, wasn't it? Charisma scored a similar goal. But when Charisma did it, I remember, he charged at it and he twatted it. And you could tell he was really straining to get it just right. And Modric does it as if it's just really casual. He's just like, here comes the ball. Oh, OK, I better just bend it in with the outside of my boot casually. Just, just swerve it not outside the post and then right into the top corner. No, no, no bother. So unlucky Scotland, but well done for scoring a goal because the one thing you do not want to do in a tournament is go out without scoring a goal. So at least they had something to cheer. Uh, and then, of course, the final England match against Czech Republic in the group. What did you make of this, Mike? Impressed or? Um, no, I wasn't really. Um, right. Now, okay, yeah, take, you know, you, you take the points, don't you? Yes, enabled us to solidify top spot. Mm -hmm. um, in that respect, yeah, cool. Um, you know, job done, if you like. But, I I mean, obviously all, all these teams are, well, not all of them, but all these teams have played again since then, and that's obviously fresher in the mind. But I would say... I don't remember being that impressed by by the by the the overall kind of play. I, I remember just looking at Harry Kane again, thinking, "Are you going to fucking show up, mate, or what?" Um, was it was it he had that one he had that one chance for the first time in the tournament until then? I think he had a chance in the box, didn't he? And he at least got it on target and forced the keeper into a save. But it was the kind of thing you thought. 
okay, Harry, can we have a few more moments like that? And then he didn't do anything else. Yeah, he just... Nothing. No. Nothing. Um, shite. And, you know, and then <laughs> we, we fucking... We rely on Raheem again. Yeah, Raheem put... Uh, do you know, I thought... Uh, I think from what I saw in most of the post-match reaction, I think most people thought the same thing. Decent first half. Some nice stuff. Um, looked like we had a sense of purpose. Second half, mostly just mediocre, like nothing to get excited about. And of course, what happened? The guy that everyone's screaming to be brought on, Grealish, comes on, sets up the goal. So... Then you get the armchair fans, obviously, oh, well, we were right, you know, Grealish has to come on. But we'll come back to that later. So Grealish, brilliant, sets up the goal. Sterling, fair play. Um, we're not the only ones to question why he was still in the team. Um, to that point, he'd scored both of our winning goals. So, yeah, I think the overwhelming... He scored all of our goals in the group stages. Yeah, I think the overwhelming feeling at the end of the group stage was... If we if this was how it was meant to go, well done, Gareth. But we got like we got an impression that did we get lucky? Was this really how we wanted to get our results, or was it just kind of we edged over the line and it could have could have gone either way? I don't know. Well, I think you're always going to ask those sorts of questions. Whether you're whether you're matching up to whatever your game plans have been or whether your plan for the whole group stages, if it's, if it's following, if it's if it's tracking, whatever his plan was. I think regardless of that, if you if you go through the group stages, well, firstly, if you go through the group stages and you don't concede, everyone says, you know, fantastic, clean sheet, brilliant, you can't get beaten. You can't get beaten if you don't concede, obviously. Great, cool. Yeah. It was only us um, at that point, wasn't it? Only us in Italy had gone through the group stage without conceding the goal. Yeah. However, if you go through the group stages in a, in a group that um, I, I, I want to avoid calling it an easy group because that's not, I don't think that's true necessarily, but it certainly could have been harder if you look at some yeah. of them. Um, trick, trick and, was probably the, the worst thing you could say. About yeah, it. yeah, yeah. I mean, you go through that, that group, the whole group stage, and you've only scored two goals. I think. You know, rightly so, people will maybe ask questions, especially when you're a team with the attacking talent that we we boast. You know, that's um, on reflection, if you look across the, the squad, I'm not saying that we have bad individual defenders. We, well, <laughs> not saying that, whether it's true or not, it's something else. But my point is, you know, we're all about, look at our young attacking talent we've got you know one of the best one of the best center forwards in, in world football or some of you should be um and look at all the young attacking um talent that we've got around him that, yeah. and they you know and they all kind of have the right mentality to come into these sorts of things and these tournaments and these games and do well and we know that and we've seen it and in, in snippets from where we where we've been able to yeah and we scored two goals in the group stage so yeah i mean you're getting I mean, questions asked. There's two ways of looking at that, isn't there? So, so the you could argue that there's a glass half full, glass half empty. The glass half empty is like fucking hell. Two goals in a group stage with the Czech Republic, the Scots, and the Croats, and then on the other side, it's like fucking hell. Three clean sheets, and you got two wins from only two goals scored. That is maximum efficiency. Um, and then the other argument, Mike, which I think is is probably the best argument, which we'll come to when comparing other groups, is it's a tournament. You don't need. It's best not to peak in the group stages. So that I think that's probably the most compelling argument. I think the other arguments are a little bit ropey, but that that. Yeah, might be I mean, to be honest, though, if, if you if you say like, oh yeah, we plan to scrape through. Yeah, well, yeah, like, not you'd that we scrape through. You'd be on. Twice, but... I think you'd be on thin ice if you tried to claim that. But what, what it is, is like, well, we'll dust ourselves down. Group stage over. Got some more match sharpness. Come on, boys. We need to up this level. And, of course, we'll go on to what happened next. Anyway, the rest of the group uh, games we're going to round off. So 
Mike, did you watch the Slovakia Spain game? Bloody hell, this was an eventful match. Yeah, I mean, what a uh, bit of a bit of a, well, bit of a spank, wasn't it? Bless them. So, uh, did you actually watch the whole game, or did you only catch the highlights? I didn't watch all of it. Is in I didn't see. I didn't see the first own goal. <laughs> oh, so let me tell you, Mike. Hang yeah, on. I, I did see the second. I'll, I'll come back to you. So I'm watching this game, Slovakia, Spain. And bear in mind, this is similar to the Denmark, right? Um, because this is going to be a theme we'll return to. So with Denmark, they lost their first two matches. Suddenly, after the amazing third result, they've qualified. And that changed the whole tournament. It was similar with Spain, wasn't it? They, they'd they been held to two draws. They couldn't score. Morata couldn't hit a cow's ass, And um, everyone was like... Oh, Luis Enrique, this is uh, this is make or break. Slovakia, you know, they're quite decent because, as we know, Slovakia had already beaten um, Poland. Yeah, Slovakia beat Poland in their first game. So we knew Slovakia had the ability to manufacture wins. They weren't pushovers. And I'll tell you what, I was watching this game and the first 15 minutes or so, Slovakia looked mildly dangerous. And Spain, the chances they got, they generally fluffed. Um, then we had, didn't we have the missed penalty um, where Morata somehow managed to put the rebound wide? Was that that game? Oh, no, I'm thinking of the game before. Sorry, my mistake. Um, after the first 15 minutes or so, where uh, I think Dubravka made a great save. and uh, Dubravka did save a penalty, right, though, in that game. Really? Yes, yes. I put. I've got it down here. Morata missed the penalty. Yeah. So Morata That's took the penalty. Right. Yeah, Morata took the penalty. Um, we all expected it to be saved. It was Dubravka who'd been decent in the tournament, right? So at that time, Mike, you're thinking, you're looking at that, and you're thinking, fucking hell, Spain have to win to go through. Slovakia looking decent. Dubravka's having a great game. You know, this could be one of the favourites, or the dark horses at least, out in the group stage. And then suddenly it all changed. It all changed with the most... I mean, I, I was I was cackling to myself at this. Um, brilliant commentary as well, because the commentator just um, went hysterical for a minute, like not believing what he'd seen. So the first own goal, basically, um, it was a comedy of errors. So I forget which defender it was, but... Suddenly, a defender had a massive brain fart, and as we said earlier in the Russia game, decided to play the ball across his own box. Um, gives it away to a Spaniard. Um, I don't know whether it might have been Pedri or someone who cracks in a shot. Great shot, hits the crossbar, and you're thinking, "Fuck, they got away with that." Anyway, the ball's taken an age to come down. Dubravka's watching it, and then just inexplicably, out of nowhere, Dubravka leaps up, kind of fumbles with his hands and pops it to his own net. The commentator can't believe it. Suddenly, Slovakia are a goal down out of nowhere. Another hilarious goalkeeper own goal. Sorry, it was Sarabia that initially hit the crossbar. Um, and you're thinking, wow, where do they go from here? And where they went from there is Slovakia absolutely caved in. And I have to say, Mike, after that... Um, if you'd have said to someone that Slovakia would deliberately throw in the game, they'd have probably said, yeah, it looks about right. Because they look so out of their depth. I, I'm not sure there's been a team who's, who's looked that pitiful all tournament. And it's amazing because the first 50 minutes, I thought Slovakia looked really decent and Spain looked scared of their own shadow. It's amazing what a, you know, a comedy goal can do to like completely change the balance of a game. Well, yeah. I guess it when you're the underdog anyway, you don't need that sort of stuff going against you, do you? But obviously they didn't have the the mental facilities to uh, to deal with that sort of stuff and they capitulated and went to shit, as you say. Yeah, it was it was quite embarrassing. Sarabia look again looked very good. I think he got braced, didn't he? Um yeah, Spain were Spain were just, um, they, it, it just seemed like a, they needed that shot in the arm and suddenly they were swarming all over them. 
And finally, after everyone saying to them, oh, Spain, brilliant at passing, great possession stats, but they're not going to win games if you don't have anyone who can put the ball in. All right, five goals in the last group game, yeah. So there we go. Spain finished on a high and comprehensively qualified. Uh, then we had another cracking final group game with Sweden Poland. Did you did you catch this, Mike? The Sweden three Poland. I didn't see the I didn't see the uh, Sweden Poland game. No. All right. Yeah, I think I only watched the highlights. But um, okay. Yeah. No. The the strikers for either team really came good in that game because Emil Forsberg, a couple of cracking finishes for Sweden. Um, but yes, yeah, Sweden in complete control, weren't they? 2-0 up. Um, Lewandowski had one of the misses of the tournament. I don't know if you saw this. See that where he he headed, he headed, um, did he, I can't remember whether he headed against the defender initially. He was about four or five yards out, missed his first header. It came, it came back to him and he managed to hit the crossbar with an open goal from, like I say, three or four yards. And at that point, of course, what you're thinking, probably similar to what me, I am, is, um, oh, right, so this is a typical Lewandowski tournament. He's marked out the tournament, and even when he gets an opportunity, he makes a puffing out of himself. But then, yeah, out of nowhere, Sweden, in complete control, Lewandowski suddenly shows his class. Maybe Sweden decided to relax a bit. Lewandowski bends a, a superb goal in from the edge of the box, top corner, um, and then... Another classic Lewandowski header to bring it level. So Poland finally shows something in the tournament, only for Sweden to... Uh, to was this the last-minute winner? I think it was, yeah. They, they the luck. Sweden polished them off. I mean, I think it was unlikely that Poland would have qualified with only a draw anyway. But, um, you know, at least Lewandowski showed up to the tournament because when you get a player as good as he is, you, you want to see him on the biggest stage producing, so... I think it's the yeah. same. It's the same problem as ever with Poland, though, isn't it? They never seem to have a really cohesive team. They have. They usually have one superstar who's invariably a striker or attacking player. Um, they might have a, a decent wing back or winger or two, but then the rest of the team is just functional. And I still don't think much of Wojciech Szczesny. I, 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 I think they do much better with Fabianski. But there you go. So Poland out of the tournament. Sweden suddenly started looking quite slick. So that was good. Um, and then we had the group of death, group F, Mike. So that finished with a couple of 2-2 two -two draws. Yeah. Did you, um, which yeah. one of the, did you watch the Portugal-France? What? Yeah, yeah, that was... Um, what did you make of that? I mean, I, well, to be fair, I, I don't know about you, but going into the game, I didn't really know what to expect. Is in what I mean by that is I didn't know what which kind of France was going to turn up. Yeah, you know, was was it going to be um, a performance befitting their squad, mm -hmm. or you know, because you know that's that's a game where you know you, if you don't watch it, and uh, you ask me the next day oh, what was the score. And I say, 3-1 France. You're probably not that surprised. But I don't think many people would be that surprised if, um, you know, per Portugal have won 2-3-1, to be honest. Because they are those sorts of teams where you just, you can never write them off, but you never know if they're going to turn up. I mean, for Portugal, I guess the, the main thing is, does Ronaldo turn up? Not that they haven't got other good players. They've got they've got a strong squad. It's not France standard, but they've got but they've got a strong squad. But yeah, I thought I thought um, I thought two two though was was probably probably about right. Well, yeah, you could argue that there were three penalties, weren't there? And you could argue two of them probably shouldn't have been given. <laughs> um, Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that was both, both Ronaldo's goals, weren't they? Penalties. Yeah, one of, one of them was a definite, but I think the other was quite ropey. And the France shouldn't have had a penalty. Mbappe just threw himself to the ground. That was a really poor decision. Um, yeah, I'm but, trying to remember them now. Do you know, the, the interesting thing is, Mike, would you agree with this? So the group of death, obviously Germany, France, Portugal and Hungary. Is there an argument that each of the big teams only had one good game? 
So France's only really good game was against Germany. Portugal's only good game was against Hungary. And Germany's only good game was against Portugal. Whereas Hungary actually performed pretty well in all three games. Well, I mean, I, I see I see your point there. And you, you might have one because, I mean, for, for Hungary to have, no disrespect to them, but to have got two draws out of that group. Yeah, and, and let's be fair, they were only six or seven minutes away from getting a draw with Portugal as well. Yeah. Yeah, for, for them to do as well as they did, I mean, well, they, they didn't embarrass themselves, put it that way. No, I think um, they did their country really proud. Like most, most teams um, probably include us, to be honest, in that uh, group would probably have done worse. Yeah. I mean, you know, so, you know, fair, fair play to them. They probably looked at that and they thought, oh, for fuck's sake. Or they looked at it and thought, brilliant. Whatever happens, we've got three big, huge games. Yeah, yeah. I, I, so, I think you're probably right. I think, I think they've gone into that thinking, I'm loving it. We're on the biggest stage. We're playing against the best players. You know, let's show what we've got. Um, but yeah, no, the, the point I was making about the other three, though, is not just that they only had one good game, but they were so erratic. Do you know what I mean? So Germany, Germany looked really fucking dangerous against Portugal, particularly like the wing backs. You know, they tore them to shreds. And then France against Germany, that was like the biggest mismatch I've ever seen. And France were playing like in, you know, as we said before, the second gear. They hardly got a second gear. They were so in control. And then, yeah, Portugal, I think I was most disappointed in Portugal. Mike, is there an argument? I guess, actually, it's probably an argument to be left for later because obviously we're just talking about the group stage right now. We'll come to this. So Portugal and France 2-2. Crack, crack and finish by Benzema as well, I thought. Superbly taken goal. Um, Ronaldo got closer to... Uh, well, he, no, he did, didn't he? He equaled Ali Dai's, um record, didn't he, in that game? He did, yeah. So, yeah, Ronaldo is now the joint all-time leading men's goal scorer on international terms. It's a fair play to him. 109 international goals. Uh and then obviously Germany drew 2-2 with Hungary. That was slightly different, <laughs> um, the context of that game. So Hungary were obviously um, uh, were winning. Um, and then it, it was quite a while before Germany manufactured an equaliser. And then literally within a few seconds, Hungary go down the other end and score again. Um, I, it did make me laugh when I watched the replay of the goal. And Leroy Zane is the um, furthest man back. If you watch the replay, um, when I forget who it is, um, is it Shaloy or someone, uh, the Hungarian, uh, the ball breaks and then Neuer comes charging out and he just thinks, oh, all I can do is throw my head at it. And so he, he throws his head at it. But if you look at the replay, the one player tracking him is Zane and he literally doesn't give a shit. Like in the replay, Zane is making no attempt to like bust the gut to intercept. He's just kind of jogging and like, oh dear. Oh, well, he's really, really poor. So, and then, unfortunately, Germany did uh, Germany did kill the Hungarian spirit with a with a late equaliser, so they snuck through. Uh, oh, so that was um, was quite. That was a good goal, though, wasn't it? Well, was it Goretzka? It was Goretzka. Goretzka. Yeah. Yeah. It was pretty decent. Yeah. So, you know, again, we we were just left thinking, what the hell is this German team? You know what? What are we? What are we watching? Who? Who are they? But they snuck through, and that was the end of the group stage. So there's an argument, Mike. As much, as entertaining as some of the goals were, the group stage was a bit of a waste of time. Because if you look at, first of all, it only eliminated what was it? It didn't even eliminate half the teams it, because of obviously the best third place. The only teams it eliminated were really predictable. So like North Macedonia, Hungary. Uh, help me out here. Scotland. Uh, Turkey, that, Wales. Turkey, no, Tur no, not Wales. Turkey. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, anyway. I oh, know Wales. 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 Oh yeah, basically. Yeah. So, so Vicky, basically, I'm so happy that happened as well. But anyway, carry on. Basically, what we're saying is, uh, the group stage 
it was a bit of a waste of time. It only eliminated six teams, and all the six, there were no surprises in the six teams. They were the six weakest, effectively. Turkey might have been a slight surprise. Anyway, we're into the we were into the knockout stages, Mike. So, the round of sixteen, Wales go into the game, maybe slightly hubristic. You know, they they were kind of. I I've got to be honest. I think they looked at us and they were like, "Yeah, we're going to outperform the English because uh, we reached the semi final last night." It's like, guys check yourself in the mirror, like rein yourself in a bit. You've had a good tournament. Just, just concentrate on doing your own thing and doing their own thing ended up being having their pants pulled down and Denmark going in dry. Yeah. Yeah. I did. Did you, um, did you see uh, Bale's interview after this game as well? Well, the one where he flounced out when they asked if he was going to retire. Yeah, and he was like saying like, like he's basically like uh, was saying that you know yeah good people should foul people and that sort of stuff. So I'd rather they rather they went out like kicking people than gone out with a whimper basically. Okay, mind you, remember this is a national team that once called up Vinnie Jones. So uh, yeah. G- I- I, I, I don't. Great. What are you talking about? <laughs> I don't. I got to admit, I, I, I don't. I think Gar- Gareth Bale, he was very good against Turkey, but otherwise, I, I'm not not sure he contributed an enormous amount to to the championships. I think uh, it proved that he's he's no longer at his peak. Um, will he will he appear at another tournament? Not sure. I mean, he does play for Wales and Wales would be desperate for him to go because he, he was so good at his peak that even declining, he's better than a lot of the players they have. I didn't. I thought Aaron Ramsey was anonymous as well. Let's be fair to Wales. It didn't help that they got a red card. Um, was it Ampadu? What did you make? Do you think the red card was fair? I can't remember. <laughs> Is it... Um, I can't remember. Was it a straight red or a second yellow? Oh, God. My memory's not that good. Uh, well, I'm trying to remember the incident. Yeah, me too. Hmm. What happened? They definitely got someone sent... Yeah, they definitely got someone sent... It, it was, it was Ethan Ampadu, wasn't it? Um, okay, I'm not, I, I can't completely remember that. Oh, that was it, Mike, because you said about um, Bale whinging. <clears throat> there was more whinging, wasn't there, from, I can't remember, Ben Davis or someone, uh, saying, oh, Wales had to travel so far for all their games. It's completely unfair. Um, and it was like, I think, was it, <laughs> somebody made, I don't know, it was Gary Neville made the point and said, well, to be fair, both of their first games were in Azerbaijan, so, you know, you, you travel in advance and then just set up your base camp for a week or so so you can't really say we've traveled loads because the travel could have been done a week before and then you acclimatize um although they did have to travel for their third game i believe uh so yeah i don't think gary never was having that uh yeah so denmark Denmark, we didn't know what to make of them. And after the game, I think it's fair to say we see that they are a very impressive team now. Um, And this was the thing I was going to say, Mike. They lost their first two games. That is normally the death knell for a team in the Euros. But because this silly format, um, a great win in their third game snuck them through. But then they have just repeated it in their uh, knockout stage. And Denmark became the first team, I believe, in Euros history to win two back-to-back games by four goals, or rather score four goals in back-to-back games. So, you know, they finished the group with a 4-1, then they dick Wales 4-0. Nico Williams with that second goal, what the fucking hell was he doing? (laughs) You could argue that Nico Williams, you you don't want to blame a single player, but he's he's going to be looking at himself in the mirror, isn't he, after that? Because it's the second goal that killed Wales, really. I think they always felt they were in the game at 1-0. But um, when when he just, like, the ball came across to him and instead of dealing with it properly, just scuffed it across goal and they immediately put it in. Uh, that really killed them. And then they were just picked apart on the break. And uh, Dolberg, I thought, was very impressive at Denmark. I don't know if you... you he got a couple of goals, didn't he? He did, yeah. No, he was very impressive. 
so Den De we should be worried about Denmark. I'm not counting any chickens, but if we were to make the semis and Denmark are there, to me, that is that is a very tough game. And we would do very well to treat that very seriously. Uh, so the Danes are looking to maybe repeat their 92, um, their 92 uh, championship win. Uh, and then we had Italy, Austria. Now, the, the interesting thing about this, Mike, was could you argue that maybe Italy, maybe Italy, I don't know, did they underestimate Austria a little bit? They made it tough. Uh, maybe, they, maybe they did. I mean, well, the result would... Um would indicate that that perhaps they did, but um, do you know what I found know. interesting about it, Mike? Uh, was um, I compared it to another game? I'm trying to remember which game I compared it to, but it it proved to me um, how how pivotal some decisions are to a team's mindset. So if you remember. It ended goalless, obviously. So Italy still kept their clean sheet in normal time. And then extra time, of course, it was still goalless when Marco Arnautovic, um, you know, nodded that header in off the crossbar. And you were like, oh, my God, Italy, Italy losing? And then, of course, we had that torturous way and it was like, he's, a, he's an eyelash offside. Now I don't know about you, but that seemed to kill Austria because I, I I thought from there you could sense that their spirit reduced, and obviously Italy then took control with the two goals. Um, you know the the Austrian goal was only really a consolation, um, really poor from Donnarumma because obviously you can you can imagine that he's probably in the running for the best goalkeeper of the tournament with all his clean sheets, but to to let that header in at his near post like that um, from a really obvious source. You know, it was just like a stooping header from a corner. Um, but yeah, yeah, so so Italy did what they had to do and, and Austria, Austria were basically kicking themselves that they responded so badly to having that goal disallowed. Yeah, that I mean, I don't, I, 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 personally, maybe it was a bit of a surprise it went to, you know, extra time and, and it finished the way that it did anyway. I think you make an interesting point, um, you know, when you say, did, did Italy, did they underestimate them? Because, I mean, like I say, no one would have really thought we would have gone to the lengths that it went to. Mm -hmm. um, I just think, I don't think, maybe maybe they did in the way they played. They, they rested a couple of players, Italy, which when you think about the fact that we're talking about like, we're not talking about group stages anymore. And yeah. it looks like they're resting players. Now, I don't know if there's, there's a reason or not, but... Yeah. Um, but, yeah, may, maybe that suggests kind of... Hang on, did you... Yeah, you know, we're a little bit complacent there. Yeah, is that complacency? Or, or, you know, or did Austria just come out and do something different to what they expected? You know, did they come yeah, out and true, yeah. do something different to... The, what their game plan suggested they'd be facing and as a result they weren't able to come up with the answers on the spot um, and it took them longer you know and into their extra time to actually figure it out but yeah yeah interesting uh, one. no you're right give credit to Austria <clears throat> I have to say by the way that um, I felt a bit for Marco Arnautovic because you, you know what he's like um, he, he, he relishes the big stage <clears throat> that would have been amazing for him to be able to score a winner against Italy um, but did, did I tell you, by the way, we, we discovered what actually happened. Do you remember when I told you when he scored in the group stages, Marko Arnautovic, and he, he went like berserk, like Paquette Spire and started gobbing off and stuff. Did you hear that he got suspended for a match because he started abusing an opposition player um, yeah. based on their nationality? Yeah. So he, was he, was in my, he was in my, uh, my team. Oh, dear. And uh, I didn't get a chance to take him out before the uh, the game was suspended for. So that pissed uh, me off. What a puffin. Um, so, yeah, Marco, you've you've let yourself down there. You know what you've done wrong. Uh, so then, we, then of course, Mike, we, to be fair, we've said this. We said this a few times. The Netherlands, they were, they were not going to win the tournament because you could see their weaknesses. Their weaknesses were very clear. Um, 
And one thing I wanted to mention, Mike, is do you know how many records are being new records are being set at this tournament? So I made a note of some of them. So um, some of the records that are set at this tournament, which is relevant to the Dutch game. So the Dutch have become the first team in Euro's history to win all three of their group games, then immediately get knocked out. Right. Uh, Denmark are the first to get out of their group, having lost their first two matches. Uh, Denmark, as I said, were the first to score four in back-to-back -back games. And then that was immediately beaten, of course, by Spain, scoring five in back-to-back -back games. Although, to be fair, one was after extra time. Um, so, yeah, some really interesting, um, really interesting records being broken. Um, I mean, is it is it too simplistic to say that the Netherlands, basically, that the big difference was De Ligt's, uh, decision to deliberately pat the ball between his legs when he fell over? Was that when they lost the game? I mean, yeah, I mean, I think you'd, um, you'd do well to argue that that hasn't influenced the result. Yeah, I don't think, I don't think the Netherlands were on particularly good form, but you would have suggested that they'd have probably found a way to win if it wasn't for De Ligt sending off. Yeah. I mean, you know, like, like, like you said, um, perhaps no one really expected the Dutch to go and win the whole thing. But, you know, before that point, um, I didn't, ex I, I still expected them to see off the Czech Republic, to be honest. Yeah, I think most people did. But of course, you know, Patrick Schick is having a great tournament. He's putting himself in the shot window. Uh, he's, you know, he, he's, he looks like a, new, a great new kid on the block. Um, another interesting thing about the Netherlands might that occur to me is, uh, I don't know about you, but I, one thing in the tournament I was always thinking when I looked at the Netherlands were, all I could think of was Van Basten, Bergkamp, Van Persie, Huntelaar, Kluiver, Van Nistelrooy, Hasselbank, all of these, Mackay, all of these glorious Dutch goal scorers, uh, Van Persie, all these glorious goal scorers and goal poachers that they've had through history, and they almost always have them in the same period. So they'll have two or three world-class centre-forwards in the same time that they can't fit in the same team. And now you look at their team and they've got like Morton Veghorst, was it? Sorry, I, I call him Morton because I'm mistaken for Morton Veghorst. Sorry, Veghorst, um, you know, that big lump up front for, for the Dutch. And, I mean, I didn't think he offered, if you think he offered next to nothing. Do you think they're really suffering? Because it seems like the first time in, in like, generations that they, they just haven't got a world-class centre-forward. Possibly. Possibly, that kind of... You're right, they've always had it. I don't... I think maybe you'd be doing them a disservice if if uh, you were to say that that's... Um, that's the way like their football's been dependent on that. I think that... I don't think... No, but as, we, as we've seen with Spain, remember, it does make the difference. Because sometimes you just need someone who is clinical, always finishes well, the turn. It's interesting you make that point, and you can draw a comparison, I think, between the two teams because um, Spain, even still now, with their squad that's nothing like what a Spain squad would be, um, the, they still are probably the best ball team at just keeping the ball and 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 you know and and knocking it around and, do, and doing the things that they do. Yeah, um, they just—it's just effortless. Like it just—you watch it and you think that this is that you don't, to other teams can't necessarily do that, even if actually they've got better okay. players. It's just something about the way they play. You get the impression and, that they've just been coached to death. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, but they've had those clinical front men to 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 put the ball away, and same with the the Netherlands, really, like. They have their own brand of football, and we've enjoyed it for years. Um, well, other than 2010. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. But, you know, historically, when I say historically, I mean, you know, fairly recent history. You know, and actually further back. The Dutch have always been good, but that, rather than, yeah. But they've, um, they've got their own brand of football, their own style of play, but they have always had, like you say, that 
people that you'd, you'd almost be more surprised if they didn't get a brace than if they did. Um, Man Huey Dong. You know, play- huh? Man Huey Dong was another one. Hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, you've, you've named there, what, like probably 10, 12, all yeah. within the last maybe 20 years of like players that just think fucking like, look at, look at this, look at the talent. We can't fail to score. And of course their attractive brand of football. Yeah. It was almost compliment to that. Uh, but I don't think they've necessarily relied on it, on the, the goal scorers. But when you have that, brand of football that style of play and you couple that with strikers that have an innate ability just to score goals regardless mm-hmm. um you're always going to do we should always do well um but yeah. yeah they haven't got that anymore so it's almost like w- what do we do now we don't have that yeah it's i just think it's a killer because it, it's similar to what we were talking about do you remember like you know, there was a period of time, I mean, we're kind of okay at the minute, but there was a period of time, do you remember, when we were really struggling for centre-backs? And you just think, oh, what you wouldn't give for a Terry Ferdinand King era again, or even just one of them back. Because, um, you know, you had players like King or um, King who, who couldn't get into the England team for various reasons. Or the time, you know, when we had players like um, Stan Collymore and Andy Cole who couldn't get anywhere near the England team. Um, and with the Dutch, you know, what would they give to be able to bring a Huntelaar or a Mackay who could never really break into the first Dutch eleven, and they would desperately want them now but it doesn't work like that anyway so the Netherlands crashed out and then we had uh, Belgium edging out Portugal hmm. yeah by one goal to nil uh, Eden Hazard's brother with a with a cracking strike I don't know about you, Mike. Wasn't a great game, really. I don't think. Um, let me set the world like it, but I think I don't know. I maybe it's because Ronaldo, but I always kind of want to. I never really want Portugal to go out. <laughs> I uh, I see what you mean. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like I always kind of. I mean, to be fair, I felt I didn't feel so bad because they won a trophy. You know, Ronaldo wanted to win an international trophy. He did it. Um, so I'm not saying I feel sorry for them. I just I like I like them. Okay, but I like them being around in the in the fixtures somewhere. Let me throw this to you, Mike, because this was something I immediately thought when I watched Portugal. Now, the first thing you thought when you watched Portugal play, particularly when they lost to Belgium is Diogo Jota, Bruno Fernandes, Renato Sanchez, uh, Bernardo Silva, Ronaldo. And you, uh, you know, not to mention, I I don't know, did they have Neves with them? But littered, littered with attacking talent, probably more than they've had any period since, you know, the Figo, Rui Costa days. And... I'm looking at them and I'm thinking, why do they not play joyful football? Why does why are they not putting together all these amazing attacking moves? And then it occurred to me that they, they have the wrong coach. Fernando Santos has always been a defensive coach. Now, you, you can argue he got the job done. He won them the European Championship. Now, that is a, that is a fantastic achievement. He deserves all the credit. But when you have the amount of talent inherent now you know you could argue back in 2016 there wasn't that wealth of talent and they were hugely reliant on Ronaldo I know they're they're still to a certain extent they look to him for their leadership in key moments but that that talent should look after itself and it made me think when I was watching them is that they're not coached on attacking moves they've basically been told well you know you're great players you know you, you know where to attack you know, they're probably given vague instructions about, you know, we attack this flank at this point or whatever, but they're clearly not working on triangles and understanding in their attacking movements because he's a defensive coach. And to me, that cost them. And, and you could argue, well, so what? They won the European Championship in 2016 playing that way. And I'm sure almost any Portugal fan would go, 
even though they're really disappointed going out of the tournament, will go, well, I'll take it because we won the European Championship last time. I don't know what do you, you think, think, but... Well, do, do you think that there's similarities then, John, between Portugal, their situation and our own? Oh, yeah, I've, I've said so. I've said I think Southgate is possibly emulating the Portugal formula. We'll, we'll come to that anyway when we go to the England game. But, uh, yeah, yeah. but Belgium, Belgium, you could argue, are quite lucky. I don't think um, Lukaku... Lukaku had some very good moments, like... I, I tell you what, Lukaku is having a fucking brilliant tournament. Um, I was, you know, I was watching him when Belgium were defending. The ball gets hit up to him. You know the old thing of oh, take some pressure off. I don't think anyone does that better than Lukaku. You, you fire the ball ten yards of space. Lukaku is like a fucking whip it, get into the ball. Not only that, he's a brick wall once he's got his body in the way. They do not get the ball off him, and he, he's capable of dribbling. Not over long periods, but he's good at dribbling to keep hold of the ball for short periods. Um, obviously, when he's in the box, he's a killer of a finisher. But he offers so much. I, I think they're. Um, I think Belgium are more reliant on Lukaku than any other player, including Kevin De Bruyne, which is good because obviously Kevin De Bruyne has been injured a lot of this tournament. I don't know what you think, but yeah, I mean to be fair. I think the, the drop-off after... I mean, Belgium, they have got... I was going to say they've got other good players that... Do you not think Vitz... Do you not think Vitz... Well, yeah, I mean, what I was going to say is the drop-off from Lukaku to the, like, the next person they might put in that role is probably yeah. bigger than the drop-off from De Bruyne. But actually, it probably isn't. So I don't really know why that is. But yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe mm. you're right. Because I, I feel like Witzel and Lukaku are the only two Belgians who've consistently performed at a good level in this tournament. Um, I'm, there's an argument to be made for Torgan Hazard, I guess. Um, but, you know, I think uh, all, of, all of the other Belgians have had a ropey game or two. They've not really pulled together and showed a brilliant team sort of performance. It's often relying on Witzel holding the midfield together and Lukaku with his brilliant finishing. Um but yeah, Bel Belgium snuck through. And you know what I thought about that? As well as thinking Fernando Santos is far too defensive, the other thing I thought is, ha, Roberto Martinez knows how to win ugly now. Because that's what's always thrown at him, isn't it? They, they, you know, they always say, oh, he's a bit childish. You know, he just loves going forward, but he doesn't know how to game manage. Well, that, that was game management. They basically squeaked the game. They held Portugal at arm's length. Well done. So there you go. And then, of course, Mike, I don't think it's hyperbole to say, because um, obviously this was the day we were supposed to originally record this. Was this the greatest day of tournament football you've witnessed in your lifetime? I'm talking about the conclusion of, what? well, one day of the uh, round of 16, which was the Croatia-Spain and the France-Switzerland games. I would... Um... I would say, I mean, from memory, probably, yeah. I mean, you know, two, two games of football, both of which have you kind of gripped to your seat um, for, for, you know, their own reasons, um, particularly how they finished, um, and 14 goals. You, know, you, you can't really see if you'd have looked at those beforehand right Croatia Spain you'd have looked at that and gone that might be a good game you, you can definitely see that being a decent game I looked at France Switzerland I thought that's got one nil France written all over it I honestly did uh, because as we've discussed before with Santos Deschamps is a conservative coach he does not go all out to, to, you know, tell his attacking talents to express themselves. But yeah, so first of all, we had the Croatia-Spain game. So in case anyone missed it, and by the way, if you have missed it, idiot, go to YouTube, go, find the highlights, watch them through two or three times. Just, I mean, the Croatia-Spain game, it was like a, it was like a, a perfect movie. So, we open the game and not long in, 
what opens proceedings is a 45 yard own goal. What better way to open a match? Now, Pedri, who's been one of the best young talents in the tournament, um, you know, people focus on, oh, Unai Simon, the goalkeeper. Unai Simon, how is he going to recover from that horrible error? What the fuck is Pedri doing firing a swerving 45 yard back pass to him? And uh, yeah, obviously, Simon does take his eye off it. Uh, he does the classic put his foot in a certain position. Oh, it's gone over his bootlegs and he's not quick enough to catch it. So we have a 45 yard own goal. And the best thing that happened was, I mean, that was funny enough, but obviously from a neutral's perspective, that's exactly what you needed to happen because what you wanted most was Spain to go behind because that would mean they'd have to play with urgency. And then you knew that some good stuff would happen. And of course, that's what did happen. Uh, Alvaro Morata managed to continue his tournament record of incredible misses. Um, I don't know if you saw this, Mike. He had a header from, was it about the six-yard box? Uh, one of the worst headers I've ever seen. And somebody else, I, I remember, I think Dion Dublin said it. it we, and obviously, he was a great header of the ball. And he, he, he was funny as hell. He just goes, that's one of the worst headers I've ever seen. I mean, it's just a shocker. Um, you know, for anyone who didn't see it, uh, he was basically point blank, no no marking, he had the whole goal to aim at, and he somehow managed to hit it, glance off the side of his head back to where it came from. Fortunately for Morata, he made it up later with a superb goal. Uh, so, fair play to him. Uh, the, Mike, a lot was made in this game about a brilliant use of substitutions by Luis Enrique. Would you agree with that? Do you think um, the substitutes that he brought on kind of changed the dynamic just at the right time? Sorry, I should also mention that um, obviously the way that the game went was Spain, after going behind, uh, then basically gradually took control, including that crack in Morata goal. No, or was that after extra time? I completely lost track of which goals were when. But it was Morata's was the fourth goal, I think. Yeah, sorry, that was an extra time. So Spain took control after going behind and it went to 3-1 and everyone was like good night Croatia writing them off this is with like eight minutes left or something and we should remember and I remember I put on Facebook um to me Croatia are like the ultimate rope dope team do you know what I mean by that what are you saying do you remember the world cup Croatia until they all the way to the final in the knockout stages, Croatia couldn't beat a team in normal time. They they went to extra time for all of their games. So much like Mohamed Ali with his rope dope, they're a team that all, only seems to like get the result when they're on the ropes. So it's almost like they pretend that they're they're on the on the ropes and ready to be beaten, but they just don't give up. Then they bounce back up and then they hit a counter punch. So. 3-1 down, eight minutes to go. Croatia, out of nowhere, they pull it out of the bag. They they work a second and a, and a third goal to equalise, take the game into extra time. Um, and we're all just like, have we seen everything here? You know, we've got a 45-yard own goal. We've got some amazing play from the Spaniards. We've got Croatia coming from nowhere to come back from the dead in the last 10 minutes. The only thing we've got left is Morata to score a cracking goal. And we got it in extra time. Finally, yeah. he did what he's supposed to do. Well, I mean, personally, I think Morata's pants. But um, obviously, you know, he, he did score a good goal. But I think he'll be, it'll mean even more. Because I think he, he's he's had a real hard time, hasn't he? From, from the Spanish press and then people back in Spain. I don't know mm -hmm. if you've heard about that. Yeah. 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 So he, he's he's come under some real scrutiny. Um and rightly so. No, I don't think any I'm not saying he's a bad player. He clearly knows how to play football, but as a finisher, he is abominable. Well, I mean you say rightly so. I I I think it's like like his family were getting threats and stuff. Oh, I mean, yeah, that's that's just the kind of idiots we deal with now. Similar to Sterling, you know, getting all that abuse. It's like 
yes, he probably didn't quite merit his place in the team, but fucking abusing people, for God's sake. Yeah. Anyway, cracking goal from Morata, and then not long after, Spain killed them off. Sarabio, great again. Pedri, other than his 45-yard own goal, was pretty decent. Um, Unai Simon recovered from that awful mistake. He was he was decent um, for the rest of the game. The other goals he conceded were not exactly down to him. So Spain march on, and now they're looking really intimidating. 5-3. Uh, and is that the last we see of Luka Modric in a major tournament? That, that's a sad thought. He might make the World Cup, I guess. Yeah, I don't... Similar with Ronaldo, isn't it? I expect to see Ronaldo at the World Cup, though. I expect to see, I expect to see Ronaldo at the World Cup. Modric, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, I, in fact, maybe I doubt it. OK. Yeah, it's quite sad, but what a player. And yeah. then, of course, Mike... I would argue this is potentially the game of the tournament was France 3, Switzerland 3. Now, what can you I mean, what can you say about this? It's just a masterpiece of a match. Well, this this is it. And I think when well, like you said, you, you before the game you you looked at that and you thought 1-0 France got written all over it. Um you know, other people may disagree, but what I think we can we, you know, we can be sure of is that nobody expected what did happen. Yeah. Um, you know, and especially on the back of, you know, so you've got the Croatia-Spain game, right? And you look at that and not only does the score line tell you, wow, what a game, but the, the actual game itself, you know, it had, like you said before, it had just about everything. It had just about everything. You you were watching from the first to the last minute. It, it had everything you, you want to see as a neutral. Um, you know, uh, it was it was a fantastic game. And you probably thought, well, we've had one game like that. Mm -hmm. Surely, you know, in comparison. And in fact, I think I remember you saying this to me. Yeah. In comparison, the France game, it's going to be nothing. It'll be rubbish. It. I couldn't see it happening. It'd be rubbish in comparison. Now, you know, I I didn't think it would be necessarily a rubbish game. Uh, maybe maybe I was a bit more optimistic for the game than a bore one nil France that, that you maybe thought. But what I I didn't think, and nobody would have thought that we'd have been treated to the game, um, you know, that, that we'll be treated to. Now, for me, um, much like uh, what you said about Spain, did them going behind, did that lay the foundation for the rest of the game to play out as it did? Quite possibly. And I think in this game as well, um, perhaps... Yeah, perhaps perhaps we had the same the same thing, the same catalyst, which turned what you're right could have been a, a fairly you know nothing game into a fantastic game of football um, with with everything you know that that, that we were treated to. We were treated to an actual good game of football, some good goals. Um, you know, oh, it was ent it was entertaining, and of course, you know the what we had. Yes, yeah, you write superb goals. So I did them probably to serve it, but um, and and also obviously you know cover it. But we we were then spoiled to probably the only thing that we hadn't had in this fantastic day of football, we were treated to the only thing that we hadn't had up until that point, which was a penalty shootout. So it just, it just capped off. It, Do you know what I mean? It capped off a day of football. It was, that, yeah, it was, per, it was close as perfection as you can get in a, in a, in a match day of football. Um, yeah. And, okay, so to set the scene, Mike, um, I, I was watching quite a few uh, videos of reactions and, um, 
I, I didn't take this in at the time because a lot of the time I, I just get barrel straight into a match. I don't look at the lineups or whatever. Um, but I didn't realize that because Deschamps was missing two left backs, he changed their formation. Now, I didn't realize this, and this was blamed for their terrible start, which is where they basically, because they were missing two left backs, they instead decided to play Rabio, I think, as left wing back and play three at the back. Now, the biggest problem with that was they played uh, Clement Longley um, from Barcelona, who had absolutely disastrous first half. And obviously that led to the first goal, because if you watch the first goal, the Swiss fair play to them. They're fucking going for the throat. Brilliant cross swung in. Um, superb header from Severovic. But when you look at who was marking Severovic, Longley looks like a child lost in a playground who makes next to no attempt to jump. Looks like he's intimidated by him. Um, so Longley was was quickly taken off at half time, and I believe um, the formation was then changed back to the, the back four because Deschamps realised what a cock had been made. It was. But interestingly, when he did that, mm-hmm. Rabiot looked better. He looked more comfortable as a conventional left back, I thought. Which is weird, yeah. But, uh, and then, yeah, so we then have a series of events. Um, who scored the first French goal, remind me, Mike? Was it? Karim Benzema. Was this the... St- the uh, ah, that was it. Sorry, I'm missing a trick. So, Switzerland one goal up. It comes to half time. As we said, Deschamps under big pressure for his ridiculous um, formation mistake corrects it in the second half. They come out. French still not quite at it. Suddenly, Swiss break into the box and a ridiculous challenge from was it Pavar, who who just went committed the cardinal sin stay on your feet no i'm gonna slide in full pace wipe him out i can't believe it took a var to check it but after it was checked penalty to switzerland and you're thinking jesus this is switzerland's chance i was hoping that um you know like probably most people i thought shakiri would take it but apparently ricardo rodriguez is the regular taker uh I didn't think it was there was very much conviction, but he at least picked a corner. He kind of got it in the corner. But Loris, who is not known for penalty saves, actually very poor at them, made a really superb penalty save. So you thought, oh God, is this an Arnautovic moment? This was where I related it to Arnautovic. Is when he scored that goal that was disallowed, the stuffing seemed to just go out of Austria, and then they ended up losing from there. You thought great have switzerland blown this now are they they're gonna you know their mentality is gonna go and of course within what was it three or four minutes they're two one down and you think yeah that's exactly what happened uh benzema scores twice uh one of them um absolutely staggeringly good first touch uh where the ball was behind him and with barely a glance behind him he manages to kind of do a, a flick, a really unorthodox flick to get the ball back in front of him in time to lift it delicately over the keeper. Just superb technique from Benzema. Um, and yeah, he, he scored two. They're 2-1 up. And you think Switzerland must have blown it now. And yeah. of course, then, oh, wow. you, you did, because you did, yeah. especially with what followed. Of course, because... You think, right, well, you know what's going to happen now. Switzerland are going to have to commit. France will start picking up the spaces. We know what the result is here. And, of course, that was pretty much proven, we thought, when the ball broke breaks to Pogba, 35 yards out, takes a touch out of his feet, bends it in the postage stamp like it's no big deal. You know, what, what a pog goal. It was, <laughs> it, you know, it, that was... What a pog goal. <laughs> Top of the pogs. Um, yeah, he might as well have smoked a cigar afterwards with a with a pair of <laughs> uh, yeah, it was it was I'm a not st- sure about his dancing, but no. But the goal was sublime. A staggeringly good goal. You could almost hear Graham Sunes gnashing his teeth. Um, <laughs> but yeah, basically you saw the best of Pogba. And it has to be said as well, Mike. I don't know about you, but a lot was said about how superb the two central midfielders for each team were Pogba for France and Xhaka for um, Switzerland. Granit Xhaka had the game of his life, 
Ron and, Xhaka did have the game of his life. Um, and, yeah, he was he was he was everywhere, and you know what we've come to expect from Arsenal. He loses discipline. He gets lazy. Uh, you know, it passes go astray. He was a hundred percent at the races. I think I, I said to someone as a joke, and you know, this is a joke. I don't mean this as a prejudicial whatever. But I said that Xhaka strikes me. He plays like he's on the spectrum. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> it's just you don't know what you're going to get from him. He's not neurotypical in the sense of playing football. Uh, similar, maybe you could argue to David Luiz. They seem to be attracted to Arsenal. But Xhaka had the game of his life. Pogba had the game of his life. But as we'll say, as we'll see. He made one crucial error, which again we could relate to the game we're discussing in a minute with Raheem Sterling. So Pogba's just bent in this incredible goal, 3 1, again, 10 minutes left, and all of us are going, Oh, you remember what happened in the Croatia Spain game? Thinking, Yeah, well, Lightning doesn't strike twice, does it? What are we talking about? Five minutes Wait, left, yes. cross into the box, another great header. Uh, was it Seferovic again? Yes, yeah, it was, yeah. Great header, yeah. Great header. And you're like, fuck me. This is going to be an exciting five minutes now. And then it and then it came. That unbelievably, Switzerland scored another cracking goal that was disallowed. Bear in mind, this was two minutes to go. Uh, Switzerland scored a brilliant goal. What was it? Offside, wasn't it? And like, mm. oh, well, that's it, isn't it? That's their chance over. No, it wasn't because there's still time. There was still time for Paul Pogba, after having an amazingly good game, to do what everyone swears at him for at United, which is dawdle on the ball, forget the players around him. And before you knew it, Granite Xhaka had steamed into him like a tank, won the ball off him. The French are too slow to figure out what's going on. Suddenly... Xhaka looks up as if he's Kevin De Bruyne, threads an incredible pass to Gavranovic on the edge of the France box. France defenders look around shitting themselves. And just as they converge on Gavranovic, he again has one of those moments where clearly a light bulb goes off in his head. And he's just the perfect fucking finish. He takes the ball in his stride, spins around with barely a look up. He knows exactly where the goal is and whips it in the far corner away from Loris. And we're looking at a 3-3 in the last minute. And one of the things that Deschamps again got massive criticism for was by this time he'd taken off Antoine Griezmann. And then Benzema got an injury. So he was going into extra time without his two most potent attacking talents. And as we know, Mike, in extra time, I can't remember a lot of what happened in extra time. It was very tense, but you want those players for penalties. Yeah. But there yeah. We go. So perhaps, perhaps he, yeah, uh, maybe you could say short sighted, I don't know, but perhaps he didn't expect it to go to pens. Um, in which you could argue that's complacency. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's know, he, might, he might still look at his team. And say, okay, right, he had missed one already, but well, I've still got Kylian Mbappe. Have we all forgotten about this guy? Yeah, I, you know, I was. Um, you know, you're very, very true. Uh, you know, I, I have still got Paul Pogba. You know, I, and it is it, not a bad penalty taker either, is he? Let's be honest. He might look like a bit of a knob taking them, but he usually oh, he's, does he's, the job. His was his was the best penalty in the shootout. Yeah, yeah. He absolutely yeah. leathered it right into the postage stamp again. Uh, so fair play to Pogba for that. Yeah, mm. extra time was very tense. Um, it looked like both sets of players were shattered. One of the only things I really remember... Oh, sorry, before extra time as well, let's not forget Kingsley Coman hit the crossbar in like the last seconds of the game. Uh, so that was like, oh, it was nearly like, 4-3 in the absolute last kick. Well, I think that was pretty much the last kick, wasn't it? It was ridiculous. Like. It was It was a, just a stupendous game. And then, yeah, we go into extra time. And the thing I most remember, Mike, was, um, yeah, Kylian Mbappe. We're waiting for him to come to life. He's put through. And you think, oh, shit, he's going to shift this onto his right and bend it in. And instead, he 
takes it on his outside and screw, screws it into the side netting and then kind of partially injures himself. And you're just like, what's going on there? Has he got his head screwed on right? Um, so Obviously not, because, you know, a, a player of his calibre, um, you know, gets that ball, plays that across goal with his right foot, um, and sinks it. Yeah. You know, at least it's the target, but someone like him sinks it. I think you well, know. As soon as he lets that come across him, he's closed off his ang- he's closed off his own angles, regardless of what the keeper does, yeah. or anyone that may or may not be able to get back. He's closing off his own angles, and then it's no surprise that he spanks it into the side net with his left foot, and you think, well, it's it. It it was bizarre, and you knew just then. Uh, he's had a he's had a shocker of a tournament because we we've seen Mbappe we know what he can do on his level <clears throat> Mbappe um, his eyes light up when he gets that ball and then in the speed of a blink of an eye he's he's nudged it with the outside of his right foot to set it and then whipped it into the far corner before the defender slid in um, so that was that was a, a warning that is like yeah Mbappe is not at it this tournament at all and then of course we ended up in penalties and. Uh, I remember saying to you, Mike, I was like, this isn't going to happen, is it? Because Switzerland had never won a penalty shootout in a major tournament. And yet again, a record was broken. They won the penalty shootout. Five penalties, other than one of them, which was slightly lucky, where Lloris, I remember they said, oh, Lloris should have saved that. But if you notice, the reason he doesn't save it is because he stupidly puts a bit of weight onto his other foot so he can't spring properly. So that's why he didn't he didn't save it. Um, but yeah, Pogba brilliant penalty, and then the last penalty came to Killian, and like he has been all tournament, he's just underwhelming. It wasn't a terrible penalty, but um, Jan Zommer knew where it was going, made a great save, and uh, the Swiss were the Swiss were loving it. Now Deschamps, I've always found him quite an arrogant character. Um, Eric Cantona doesn't like him, so that's enough for me. If the king put, put gives the thumb down, uh, I've always thought Deschamps is, is is quite an arrogant character, considering what a limited player he was. Amazing career, you know. He's he won the World Cup as a player and a manager. Hardly anyone's ever done that. That puts him in the elite level, like Franz Beckenbauer. Um, you know, captain captain the team and manage the team to a World Cup. He's won the Champions League. Uh, with Marseille, for God's sake, the only the only French team still to have won the Champions League, and he was the captain. So he's had an amazing career, but as a player, nobody really enjoyed watching Didier Deschamps. He did a great job, but he was not a flair player at all. Um, but he does have this arrogance, and um, you wonder whether that mixed with a bit of complacency. And you know, I don't like to throw around um, national stereotypes, but the French do have a reputation, don't they, for not having the no, this isn't like French people in general. I'm just talking about the French national football team. They've they have a <laughs> reputation for not getting. Sure. Well, it's the French and the Dutch, isn't it? They have a reputation for their players not exactly getting on with each other and rifts and uh, things like that. So I don't know. But what we can say is Switzerland are a game of their lives and just just amazing. And then Mike, we're on to we're on to the big dog, England Germany. Give me your thoughts. Well, um, I think you, you see, look, you see those, um, you see the lineups and you think, fucking hell, Gareth. Um, I think we all did. We've got eight defenders on the pitch, pal. <laughs> um, you know, uh, we've got eight defenders on the pitch. We've got Kane who's not firing. And um, yeah, good luck to Saka and Sterling. But um you know, at the end of the day, it, it, you know, it got the job done. And, you know, maybe the right thing to do was to match them. I was um, going to say that because he he did change the formation specifically. And one thing I've been very impressed with Southgate, it looks as if he's been coaching the players to play in different systems. Yeah, or, you know, certainly he's, he's, he's letting them know exactly what is expected. So, 
okay, you know, even if we're going to play a, a formation or a system or a style that's slightly different, be under no illusions, but like the this is your this is what your responsibility is for this game. This is what I want you to do. And you should be able to do that to, to top flight football players and they will understand. You know, they they should have a, a basic understanding and be able to follow instructions regardless of what you ask them to do. They should be should have that much they spend that much time playing the game that you know, it, it shouldn't almost be completely foreign to them. But, yeah, I, I guess it was wise to to kind of match them up and, and look to um, almost mitigate the effect that their wing the, the German wing-backs can have because, you know, that they have um, they have looked dangerous. Yeah. Um, you know, and it was almost like okay, so we are we're effectively, especially with with Saka's uh, inclusion again. You look at it and you think, well, because uh, obviously you know uh, you know Foden was available, etc. You look and you think, okay, this is this is we're set up to counter. We're, we're set up to play counter attack football, um, and you know, there's two ways of looking at that. You can look at that and think. Look at all of the attacking talent that we've got, um, and you're playing eight defenders basically. Uh, I kind of felt like looking at it, um, but you know, the other way of looking at it is say, Well, you know, it's, it's one thing, it's almost like um, like you say, Martinez, for example, he gets criticised because he just wants to play, you know, all this this, this football and uh, attack and just concentrate on doing all the all the all the glamorous stuff. And do you know what? There's something to be said for it. But also, you have to be kind of pragmatic. You have to you have to you have to play what's in front of you. It can't always be, especially in tournament football. You can't always be. This is what I want to play, and the, uh, that's it. I'm just doesn't matter who we're against, and there's something to be said for playing your own brand of football and, and having your own style and imposing your own personality on the game and going. Do you know what? We play tiki taka football, so regardless of who we play or where we play or what the situation is, that's what we do. That's our identity, and we're going to stick to it. There's something to be said for that, and it's if you can get yourself into a into a position, a strong enough position with a strong enough squad. Um, to, to do that, you know, we've seen teams do it. We've seen Spain do it for a number of years, etc. We've te- seen teams do that in the past. If you can do that, fantastic. But there's also something to be said for um, being able to, well, having the tactical nous to be able to identify what you need to do in order to nullify your, your opposition. Yeah. You know, because that is... It may not be how you win games, but it's certainly how you prevent yourself from losing them. So, uh, which seems to very much be the way that we've, that's the consistent theme that we've had going through the competition. Set up not to lose. And, um, you know, I hope Sterling pokes one in. Um, (laughs) Um, Yeah. Mike, I don't, I, I know. I've got to be honest, um, obviously everyone in England's an armchair fan, us included. Uh, some know more than others, but I, it baffles me how you... I've got to be honest, I probably would have been like this at 22. Maybe they're all 22-year-olds. But the amount of fans who are going, yeah, we got this far, but why can't we fucking attack more? Gareth Jalfgate needs to change the team. Gareth Southgate needs to do this. I'm just like, guys, do, do you want to go out of a tournament again? when it looks like it's really good for us. Because at the moment, and by the way, the thing I really like about Southgate is he doesn't take popular decisions. But he even said in the interview, he said, listen, I'm going to die. If I make the decision and we don't win the game, then I get killed, metaphorically in the media. And fair play to him. He realises that. And he's saying, I make my own decisions. I've worked out the best way to get through this tournament. Um, 
I think the players know exactly what I want them to do. And this is how we're going to do it. You know, I was listening to the kickoff um, online and, and the true Geordie guy who was banging on about, I know we got the result. I know we beat Germany. I know, by the way, first knockout stage defeat of Germany since 1966. Um, I know we beat them, but we have to start Grealish. And I'm like, I was saying we should start Grealish before the Germany game, but why do we need to start him? If it works bringing him off the bench and he's still doing the business, just do that. Do what works. You know, yes, I would love to see Grealish from the start, spraying passes around, doing these little bursts into the box. We, we all want to see champagne football. But if Southgate decides, no, 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 I'm bringing him on when the defence is tired... Who are we to say he doesn't know what he's doing? He's brought him on and he's literally been the key part of both the goals. Like, he's yeah, a uh, leader, to be fair. So you I'll can say. see, when you kind of move yourself out of the mindset of, like, oh, come on, why can't we attack more? And you start to look at... Oh, I'm going to sneeze. No, I'm not. You start to look at... Um, you know, the reasons why you might make these decisions and actually analyse it properly, it makes sense, you know. Um, a lot, for example, you know, you, you, you alluded to like a potential, uh, something that Gareth's potentially thinking regarding Grealish is bringing him on when everyone's tired. Um, he wins a lot of free kicks. Uh, tired defenders will leave their legs out, will make silly decisions and will... We'll, that's how you capitalise on someone who's going to win a lot of free kicks, yeah. on, you know, in penalties and things like that in in dangerous areas, free kicks in dangerous areas. And, you know, who better to tire out these defenders than Saka and Sterling? Players who... But Sterling's always looking to get in behind. Saka's always looking to run at people. They're always turning them around, making them do what they don't want to do, run back towards their own goal, back, forward, like, they also move across, tiring these defenders out mm -hmm. for Grealish to come on and make the most of, of their tired legs. Yeah. If that's his strategy, um, and I'm not suggesting it is necessary, but if it is, you know, you can't just say, well, it's shit. Yeah. Because it's not. Yeah. Because it, it, not only is it working, but also just to think about it, it does make sense. It, you well, know, and who are we to tell him that he's wrong? Because yeah, he keeps throwing everyone up. Yeah, this is my this is my argument. Is it seems to be more a case of the Jack Grealish fan club. Now, don't get me wrong. I think he's the best English midfielder since Gaza. I think he's great. He has such an impact. But I'm not going to say, yeah, we've had a we've we've had a great result against Germany. But you know, we we need to drop one of those midfielders and just put Grealish in there. It's like no, because because I'd rather win the tournament and Grealish has come on. 20 minutes in each game, probably set up a goal. Grealish is going to prefer lifting a trophy and saying, oh, well, I made the difference. You know, people always forget. So if he, what, is it, what if he starts Grealish next game, five minutes have gone, he gets injured in a bad tackle. And then that's a really poor decision, isn't it? Because he's injured for the rest of the tournament. At the moment, he's using him perfectly. Well, I don't think you can think about what ifs like that, but I get, I get what you're no, saying. No, what I was trying to say was, it's not as if like, oh, if we play him, you know, I mean, again, the true Geordie was making this point. Well, listen, if he creates this many chances when he comes on, then how many is he going to create from the start? Because then we could get ahead and we're not relying on late. And I'm like, yeah, but that logic doesn't apply. It's not like a video game. Just because you start someone doesn't mean they'll have the same impact. And like you say, he was forgetting the variable of tired defenders. And personally, I think, you know, I'm not a Southgate fanboy. I've always said the tactics that Southgate employs are very risky because if they fail, he hasn't got credit in the bank because people will say, well, thanks. We didn't enjoy watching any of that. And now we've been knocked out. Let's be fair, that game against Germany was pretty difficult to watch at times. You know, you were never comfortable. You were never really thrilled. But when the goals went in, you were just like, this is happening. This is finally happening. And we've knocked out Germany. We, we have to say to Southgate, he knows better than we do. 
you know, people yeah. are saying, what the hell, why the hell is he not using Sancho? Me too. But if he's not using Sancho and we're progressing in the tournament, what does it matter? He's getting the job yeah. done. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree with that sentiment entirely. Anyway. Um, I think when, I, when Sterling scored, I didn't think we were going to lose. I couldn't no, see us losing. Although, to be fair, similar to Pogba, um, you know, Sterling, do you know what? I, I figured out that Sterling reminds me of the treatment of, but this is not political, but he reminds me of the treatment of Corbyn. And the reason I say that is because the people who defend Sterling, so with Corbyn, the people who defended him, which included me, at times it would seem almost over the top, like you were treating him like Gandhi. And people would say that and it would be like, oh, is this a personality cult? And the reason you would is because the abuse and the smears were so over the top that you felt like you had to compensate. Now, I feel like Sterling is kind of the same. Do you know what I mean? Because he gets so much abuse from the tabloids and probably racist abuse on social media that he has an OK game. And suddenly, you know, Rio Ferdinand's coming out and going, he was man of the match. He's the best player at this tournament. And you're like, Rio, steady on. He's been OK. He's been good. The, the last game he had, he was very good. I think we can agree he was very good against Germany. But saying that, he nearly gave them a goal on a plate. You know, when when Muller went through, which England fan genuinely thought, oh, he's not going to score this? And that was Sterling. That was Sterling's back pass that set, set up Havertz and then Muller. And um, I was just like, I couldn't believe he missed it. I was like, Germany have turned into us. <laughs> And it was amazing, like, Muller having his hands on his head like this. I was just like, it's like the world turned upside down. But anyway, um, I think Michael will uh, agree, of course, that it's definitely coming home. So let's look forward. I think it is. I think the only, the only pro probably other thing to mention <clears throat> out of that game is obviously Kane finally scored. Um we're all hoping, I believe, that that will be the catalyst because... Please, because yeah, he... I think, what was it, the 86th minute Kane scored? Yeah. Um, and it took him 86 minutes to actually fucking do anything. Um, I, I... And he took his header well. Very well, yeah. It was a good goal. That is exactly head... what we need from him in the team, though. He's a killer in the box. No, that's what he's there for. If he's not doing anything else... He fucking needs to put these chances away. So let's hope he goes on a run. A couple of half decent defensive clearances. Um, to be fair, in the but... build up, in the build up to what was it, the first goal, he did well because he he got the ball and I thought he was going to spin and have a crack, and instead he like laid it wide, and then that led to um, Shaw, you know, squaring the ball for Sterling. So fair play to him there. I, I think I think his overall performance though was was still generally anonymous. To, I, he just looks he just looks tired. He looks fatigued from from mm -hmm. from the get go. It just looks like he's just got nothing to inject into the game. You know, we know that he's not Did known you, for his pace or anything like that, and we're not you know not expecting him to outrun Sterling and beat into balls and things like that. But he just looks... A little bit of him, Mike, do you think we're expecting a little bit too much of him because we know what he was like with Spurs? Maybe he's just supposed to be like Gary Lineker at this tournament and do no. nothing except sniff it out in the box. When you've got... No, when you've got a world-class striker, a world-class centre-forward, mm -hmm. I don't think it's too much to expect performances from him. Fair enough. But if if you've got, you know, that's there's no. I don't. I don't think we expect too much at all. Okay. In fact, if anything, he's getting off very lightly <laughs> at the moment. You know, there are other players getting a lot more stick than he's getting that yeah. probably don't deserve it as much. So. Okay. So okay. Um, Anyway, amazing results. So, well done, England. So, bring on the Ukraine. And, of course, the last game, which decided who we play. Mike, was this the other... Well, obviously, no. The Switzerland was the biggest shock. Um, but, yeah, and then maybe the Netherlands. But this was a mild shock. I think we all expected Sweden to win this. Um, um, particularly because Ukraine have never been this far in the Euros. Um, yeah, no. 
I definitely expected Sweden to win. Yeah. Um, um, for, Forsberg again with a, another great goal. Um, is it is it too simplistic to say Sweden probably would have seen the game out, but for the red card? Did you see the red card challenge? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I'm yeah. trying to remember exactly when that was. Yes. Um, I think it was the second half, wasn't it? I can't remember exactly what minute. I can't remember what minute it was. I'd be interested to to hear that, uh, to see that, actually. But, yeah, I thought, well, um, first, uh, it, was, it was a decent enough game. Um, Zinchenko Probably. scored his goal very well. That was, a, yeah, no, that was a bloody cracking technical goal. Because was it y- Yarmolenko stabs the cross in with the outside of his boot? And then Zinchenko waits for it to land just right and then strikes through it beautifully, um, crashing into the net. So, yeah, that was a brilliantly technical goal from the Ukraine. Uh, Forsberg took his goal very well. Do you know what I thought as well, Mike, Um, is Alexander Izak picked a bad time to have his worst game of the tournament? Yeah, you don't know if that's... You know, maybe the pressure, the situation, getting to him, he's, he's young and very young. Or yeah. if it just, you know, you can't, nobody, who no matter who you are, has a great game all the time. But yeah. Um, but fair play to Ukraine. Tell, yeah. You know, they, they kept the Ukraine, the biggest credit I can give to the Ukraine is it got into, um, sorry, I keep calling the Ukraine, it should just be Ukraine. Um, they got into extra time and you could see that they weren't settling for penalties. I think Ukraine realised we need to seize the opportunity because penalties is a lottery. They kept knocking on the door and then in the very last minute, pretty much, great cross, brilliant header, um, then peeled his shirt off to show off his sports bra. (laughs) Um, And uh, I'm told that that's a special vest that apparently measures his his variables. It does, Um, yeah. But yeah, it was... um, it, it was great. It was great to see a team go for the throw and think, no, we're going to win this in, in regulation time. And fair play to Shevchenko. Because I think apparently he got a lot of stick when he got the job um, because people said, you're only appointing him because he's a national hero. He's got no coaching experience. Fucking look at what he's done with the Ukraine team. Furthest they, deepest they've been into a Euros. And luckily, we won't feel too bad if we do knock them out because they've already set records. So, well done, Ukraine. Um, there were a lot of fucking injuries. I don't know if you noticed that. There was a particular extra time. I think there was a player going down every two minutes from every from each side. All the time. And it was, I mean, it was brought on by fatigue, wasn't it? Let's... Clearly. No, you could tell that, yeah, it was like cramp. It was like a slip. Oh, you know, I've tweaked something. Yeah, it was, it was a bit grim. But obviously our eyes lit up because we were like, Excellent, you know, we're gonna have a shattered team, potential injuries. Um, I also I enjoyed the um, the Swedish coach. I'm sorry, I forget his name, you know, the, with the glasses. Uh, he has quite an amusing nice. face, and the look on his face when Sweden lost, he was just like, he was so fucking fuming. <laughs> uh, so unlucky, Sweden, y- you. You put off a, put on a good show for the Euros, but Sweden are out, and it's Ukraine next round. Mike, a few things I noticed as well. Um, we've had some superb headers in the tournament. I don't know if you thought so as well. Absolutely cracking headers, I thought. Uh, we've had a lot of woodwork strikes. Amazing number of spectacularly funny own goals. Um, and, the, and the one thing we should mention, Mike, I know it's been said a few times in the commentary, this is possibly the highest standard of refereeing I can remember at a tournament. I don't know about you. I struggled to think of a major decision. that I, The only thing that comes to the top of my head was when Kylian Mbappe threw himself over for the penalty against Portugal. Other than that, I don't think I've seen any decision where I've been like, fucking hell, ref. Well, look, I think I think you're right. Yeah, the ref has been good. VAR hasn't ruined anything yet. V- VAR is very not jinxed it. Oh, sorry, yeah. Let's not mention that anymore. Anyway, 
It's been a very long show. I hope you stuck with us all the time. Listen, if you like what we're saying and you want to hear the next update, because we will be going again after the quarterfinals, we will be back. So tune in then. Click the subscribe. Why not click the bell? You'll know exactly when the next Extra Time comes out. Recommend yeah. us to your friends if you think we're talking sense. Uh, show us to your friends and tell, tell them what Muppets we are if you think we're talking bollocks. Mike, right. anything to finish with? Other than it's coming home. Oh, uh, nothing else really needs saying, does it? Nothing. Everything we've spoken about for the last 73 hours um, <laughs> doesn't matter because really it's coming home. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, the whole show has been almost as thrilling as the France, Switzerland and Spain, Croatia games put together, I think. I think that's, I fair. Think that's fair. I'd say, yeah. yeah. And until next time... England, we hope, will be reporting on a fantastic performance from you.